Good morning. Uh, I am so excited to be here with you today. As am I. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's feeling wide awake, ready to go. <laughs> Good. Um, I am here uh, in part because uh, Valerie has a new book coming out April 2nd, Finding My Voice, uh, which I had the privilege of reading early in advance to prep for this. And I have to say, it was a really fascinating book. It t details your childhood, your career. One part that I found really, really uh, wonderful and surprising was your management tactics. So we're going to have a great conversation today um, going over all of that. Um, but I thought I'd start really in the same way that you start your book, with your early life. And you have an interesting early life. Um, and I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about how, what that meant. The line that stood out to me was that your parents took you across the color line around the world. Tell, tell the audience what, that, what happened and how that sort of affected your own personal growth. Sure, thank you, Melissa, and good morning again, everybody. So back in the um, mid-50s, really like 1954, my father, who's a physician, was looking for a job when he was leaving the Army. And he wanted to study academic medicine and do research. And so he applied for jobs at all of the major teaching institutions around the country, and he couldn't get a job where his salary was uh, equal to his white counterparts. And he found that very frustrating because he had excellent credentials, well-educated, uh, done well at every level along the way, but hit that color barrier. And so he and my mom started exploring options outside of the United States. And through the uh, public health department, federal public, international health department, he started to explore um, options that were available where he could get in on the ground floor in a community that didn't have um, excellent hospitals. And so a position came to his attention, which was to help start the Namazi Hospital in Shiraz, Iran. My parents had never been any further than Europe. They didn't know anything about Iran, the culture, the people, the government, anything at all, the language. But they were a little crazy. And so they decided, off we'll go. And so my dad helped start the Namazi Hospital. He ran the Department of Pathology there. And I was the second baby born in the hospital. They practiced on some other baby before I came along. <laughs> Got it right, and then we lived there until I was five. And my father ceased becoming a black physician from the United States, he was an American physician. And it really helped him grow and develop his confidence to not be a second class citizen, because if you keep in mind, that was during the Jim Crow era, where they both grew up, my mother in Chicago, my dad in DC, subject to restrictive covenants, and uh, they really had you know, a lot of barriers to reaching their dreams. And so his confidence grew in Iran, and since that was my first experience, I think I came into the world thinking that I was as good as everybody else. You know, one of the things that is particularly uh, beautiful about your book is you speak a lot about your family history, and your father is not the only one that took a risk with uh, a big career decision, um, po possibly inspiring you to make your own risky choices in your career. Um, and one thing I think that as we talk about, what we, we sort of exist in a news environment that just talks about the latest news break. Um, and what I loved about seeing sort of the history of your family is a reminder of how close we are to some of those really devastating policy decisions of the Jim Crow era. You mentioned that an uncle, uh, what, his father was a slave. Mm -hmm. um, and your family has a, really, was, has a very rich history of, uh, that tells a big part of what it was like to be black in America. Um, what are some of the family stories that, you, that sort of rung through your head as you grew up um, and that made you understand, even though you were born in Iran, how it was, it was to be black in America? Yeah, so my great-grandfather, Robert Taylor, was the first African-American to go to MIT. And 1888 is when he began at MIT. He grew up in North Carolina. His father was born a slave. And he was the product of a white slave master. And so if you think about a man who grew up um, as a slave, who's freed with the, as a result of the Civil War, and then he has the wherewithal to work as a carpenter and save enough money to send his son to MIT. And I often, growing up, thought about what that train ride from Wilmington, North Carolina, to Boston must have been like, and what was life like for my great-grandfather to 
integrate a school, be the first African American there, earn a degree in architecture? Uh, what was it like with his classmates who probably had never known a black person as a peer before? And then he did that. And the thought that he did that, and then he went to, uh, he was recruited by Booker T. Washington to go to Tuskegee, was called Tuskegee Institute then, in Tuskegee, Alabama. And he helped design many of the buildings um, on the campus. And he was, as far as we can tell, our nation's first African American trained architect. And so anytime I'm nervous and I think, well, maybe I can't do something, I just think about him and standing on his shoulders and what he accomplished in his lifetime. And so, but obviously he, his son, my parents both overcome many, many obstacles as well. And growing up, my, my parents used to always say, look, you're going to have to work twice as hard and don't be afraid of hard work. And don't, anytime I would come home and say, well, so-and-so wasn't fair, they're like, who told you life was fair? Nobody, it's nothing, it's nothing fair about it. Just get back out and work harder. And with a little bit of luck, hopefully things fall your way. Right. And let's talk a little bit about that, because I don't think your childhood was all just fun trips through Egypt and, um, and, uh, and freedom abroad. Yes. Um, when you came back to the US, you speak a little bit about the, uh, the integration process of coming back and recognizing. Yeah, culture shock for me. Big culture shock. Oh my gosh. So yes. if you think about it, I spent five years in Iran, and obviously, Back in, well, maybe it's not obvious, so some of you are young or not students of history, but back then, the United States had much better relationships with uh, the government of Iran. And so we were welcome there, and there were physicians from all over the world that were working with the Iranian physicians, sharing best practices on this hospital compound at the Namazi Hospital. So from there, my father started doing research on fava beans, and it caught the attention of uh, a physician at the Galton Labs, University College of London. And so he was recruited to go there, just at a time when my parents had been away for five years, six years, and they thought maybe it was time to start migrating their way back to the United States. And so off my father went to London for a year, and then from in London he was giving a paper at some international conference, and the dean of the University of Chicago Medical Center was at the conference and heard his paper and recruited him to be the first physician to black physician, first one that ultimately became tenured at the University of Chicago. So he used to often say that sometimes the shortest distance to where you want to go is the longest way around, because that job was not available to him six years earlier. But uh, that adventuresome spirit actually helped inform a lot of my life decisions as well. But so the point is, when I arrived back in the United States at age five, almost six, here I am, I uh, speak three languages, French, Farsi, and English. Uh, I had adopted a British accent in that one year that we lived in, in London. And my, my parents plop me down, and I'm tested. And at that point, because I'd had great schools, I'm five years old in second grade. And they plop me down in the middle of a public school in our neighborhood. Well, I used to get beat up every single day for a whole range of reasons. And so if you imagine, I'm going back to what my mother called home. We lived in the same neighborhood where her mother and sister and extended family lived, and my father was delighted to be returning to the United States. And to me, it felt like a foreign country. And we had traveled, as you said, Melissa, extensively, but I always knew that I would be going back to home. And this was the first time someone was telling me that this was, this was my home, but yet I was getting beat up all the time. So I dropped that British accent in like two days flat. I figured that out. <laughs> and I had a younger cousin who used to come and defend me. She was scrappy, and she used to get into fights on my behalf, which was kind of embarrassing, because she was younger. Uh, <laughs> But eventually, I just, I just wanted to be like everyone else. And I would, you know, I'd go to the grocery store, and my mother would want to chastise me, and she didn't want to do it in English. So she learned Farsi, and so she would speak to me in Farsi, and people would stare. And I just remember wanting to go, please don't do that. I just want to, I want to fit in. And uh, it took me a minute to really fit in. But I wish that I had kept up the Farsi. That might have come in handy. And, uh, I wish I'd had the, the confidence to really appreciate that there's, there is a magic in that adventure, right? And, yeah. and I, it took me a while to get that. Yeah. So it sounds like you went through this sort of really significant transition at a young age, and it, and it, and it kind of put you a little bit behind closed doors for a while. It took you a while to come out. I was painfully shy. Yes. 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 Extremely shy. I could never have spoken to like an audience half this size. <laughs> uh, well into my adulthood, frankly. And it sounds to me that what sort of happened to you in your adulthood was also a, a bit of a difficult situation. It was working, you had you'd accomplished a lot, you'd gone to Stanford and then to law school, you were hired by a very prestigious law firm, um, and then you find yourself crying in your office, uh, weeping over both an unhappiness at work, but also an unhappiness in your personal life as well. Yeah, yeah. 
and you, were th and you made some decisions to start a new life. Um, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you found that inner strength, that, that decision, determination to take a risk and sort of throw out this life that you'd crafted for yourself and do something new. Misery. <laughs> misery is a great motivator. Let me tell you something. I was so miserable. I would sit in that office and turn away from the door so no one could see me crying. And I would just go, this could not be my life. I was not meant to be this unhappy. And I had made this 10-year uh, plan when I was coming out of college. How many of you made plans like you had a clear idea, right, of what you wanted to do? I was going to go right to law school. And then I was going to figure out what was my passion in the practice of law. And I kind of stumbled into law school, but I was determined to fall in love with it. And then I was going to fall in love with somebody and get married. And you know, I was really conscious of that biological clock tick, tick, ticking. So I wanted to have a baby by 30. And I figured by 31, hey, it's a wrap. And I'm living happily ever after. <laughs> that was my plan. So I went right to law school. I moved back to Chicago. I joined one prestigious firm. and. I decided it wasn't enough of an opportunity, so I went to an even more prestigious law firm looking for that passion. I married figuratively the boy next door. In that, our moms grew up together in the same apartment building. Uh, our grandmothers were friends. Uh, he was a physician. My dad was a physician. Our, I, mean, I used to like look at him when he was an altar boy at 12, and I was eight, and I just fell in love with him back then, one of my first crushes. Uh, what could go wrong, right? Oh my goodness, so much. So much could go wrong. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, he looked great on paper is all I can say. <laughs> Not so good in the execution. Uh, I did have my baby right on time, just shy of my 29th birthday, the smartest thing I've ever did. She's now 33 and of course the apple of my eye. And I just could not stand practicing law at this law firm. And it wasn't just this law firm, it was just I was not fulfilled by what I was doing. And I was leaving Laura every single day to go do something where I thought, she will never be proud of me doing this, and I will never be very good at it. I would stare at those timesheets. Anybody who's been a lawyer or a law firm, nothing worse than timesheets. And they would just remain blank because I couldn't think of what I'd done that was productive and worth billing to a client. And so I, um, I'm just telling you all the truth. Uh, part of getting comfortable writing a book is you're like, okay, if you're not going to be honest and tell the truth, then what's the point? So you first have to start telling yourself the truth. I was not that great at what I was doing. But then Harold Washington, who was the first African-American mayor of Chicago, was re-elected to his second term. And I have a friend who had worked, left his law firm, worked for him in the first term, and he was going back to his law firm, and he said to me, if you join city government, you will feel a part of something more important than yourself. And there was just something about those words that resonated with me, and I've never forgotten. And so I took this leap of faith, and I joined the City Hall Corporation Council's office. I had no title or anything. I showed up on my first day having left this beautiful office on the 79th floor of what was then called the Sears Tower in Chicago. And I walk in, and my boss says, let me take you to your office. And he does air quotes. And I'm like, why are you doing air quotes? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it was a cubicle with a window facing an alley. And I did gulp, I will be honest, I took a gulp. And then I said, no, you know what? This feels right, and it changed my life. And I think my, my lesson in that is that I, had tended, I tended to crave the straight line rather than having the confidence to appreciate the adventure and the zigzag. And everyone had said, don't go to City Hall, you're taking a cut in pay, it's a step down. And I had to just develop that kind of internal fortitude to say, no, this is what's right for me. And I think my parents' example was helpful, but even they said, don't go to City Hall. My mother's like, I paid all that money on tuition, and you're going to go work there. But there changed my life in a very wonderful way. Good. I want to get to that, but I want to, before we do, I think that, you know, one of the reasons that, I, that you probably could take the adventure was because you came from a very strong foundation, uh, despite the um, difficulties of being black in Chicago at that time. You had a very um, tight-knit family yes. that had a lot of um, support, a lot of success. Um, and when you made the decision to become a single mother, you probably had more support than others. Um, and I know that uh, that is one of the things that, when we think about what holds people back, what holds people back from their real success, um, that's something that you've made a, a primary issue for, your, for, for yourself, noticing that uh, being a mother, particularly being a single mother without support, um, is problematic. So can you talk a little bit about what you learned as a single mother and what women need yes. to succeed? 
Sure. Well, look, as you said, Melissa, I was one of the lucky ones. I had two parents who loved me unconditionally. They provided me with support and a safety net, so I knew if I took a chance and stumbled and fell, they would help pick me up. Uh, they were completely supportive of my decisions once I made them. They're, they thought their job was then to get behind and help me be successful. My father picked up my daughter every day for school and brought her home from the time she was in nursery school till way after she got her driver's license throughout high school. And I thought it said a lot about her that even when she could drive, she chose to still have that daily ritual with my father, which is really important. Uh, and so, and I had the resources of being able to have a sitter who I hired when Laura was uh, three months old. This is after having interviewed a woman who told me that Laura was reincarnated and so she was so glad to meet her again. Um, <laughs> and another one who grabbed her when she walked in the door and kissed her on the mouth. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then, really, Mrs. Doubtfire showed up on our doorstep and stayed with us until long after Laura graduated from high school. And so I say all this to say, I had everything going for me as a single mom, and yet I still felt like I was hanging on by my fingertips. And so I used to often think, well, what about you know, the minimum wage worker who's working two shifts and is leaving her child in a circumstance where she doesn't feel she's safe and you can't breathe when you're in that situation. And so part of what I tried to do in the White House, during the White House Council on Women and Girls, was to think about those working moms. And we broadened it to working families because uh, I really think that men who don't participate in their child rearing are missing out on one of the magical things of life, but they're not often in a position either because of programs or culture to actually participate in the way that they should. And so I, I, part of the policies that we adopted were really informed by my own decisions such as equal pay for equal work and workplace flexibility, which I knew I needed, and uh, making sure that paid leave and paid sick days are a part of everybody's benefit package, and an environment that's free from sexual harassment um, and violence. And you know, I came of age in the early 80s, and there was a lot of harassment that went on. And as women, we didn't feel empowered to, to do much about it. And so you tolerated it, you learned to ignore it best you could, you tried to keep yourself as safe as possible, but there was not a movement that was looking out for us back then. And so all of those kind of personal experiences, Melissa, really helped ground me with what I thought should be priorities from a policy perspective and an advocacy perspective. I'm gonna jump forward in time a little bit because I just wanna stick with this, this idea around women. One of the things that has been reported on in terms of your role in the administration, in the White House, was really to help advocate for women in the administration. I think there was a clear arc where when it started, perhaps there weren't as many women speaking up yes, in the White House. That's true. Uh, and, um, and then towards the end, it really felt that there was a lot more women in senior positions. There was a lot more openness in, that, in those conversations. What were some of the tactics that you yourself used to push for more women in that administration and also to pr provide a space for them to have voices within the administration? Well, it helped very much because tone does start at the top. And so President Obama had always been surrounded by strong women, beginning with his mother and his grandmother who both worked. And certainly he's married to a pretty strong, successful woman in her own right. And he has two daughters. And so he wanted to create an environment where diversity was viewed as a strength, diversity of ideas, life experiences, gender, race, religion, geography, you name it. N all with the position that if he had people around him who didn't have the same life experiences, they would help him make different decisions. But I think as in all situations, when women and men come to the table, you carry with you your baggage of your last experience. And so I was the only woman in a senior position um, who had been a part of the campaign and who had history with him. And so I think when the women came in, because we had so many men who'd been in the campaign, they kind of were trying to come in and get their footing. And if you all will remember, when President Obama took office, we were in the middle of the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression. And every, it was like drinking from a fire hose every single day, and there was a lot of testosterone and a lot of loudness going on. And I began to notice that the women's voices were shrinking. And when I mentioned it to the president, his immediate reaction was, I need them to speak up. If they don't speak up, they're not doing their jobs. And so he said, let me have them over for dinner. And so he had the senior women over for dinner. And I had said to each of them, you better go in there and tell them exactly what's on your mind and what you need to thrive. Because if I've told him this is a problem and you go, oh, no, everything's fine, well, then I'm going to be, you're going to have an issue with me after that. <laughs> so fortunately, they all did uh, speak up. And it was a, it was, just, it was the day that the Fort Hood assassinations happened. And so if you can imagine what was going on through all of our minds at that 
horrendous moment. And yet he showed up on time. He spent two and a half hours. He listened really closely. He gave some suggestions, and he said the same thing to them. He said to me, look, I need you to speak up. And this is the White House. Who said it's going to be easy? You're going to have to fight for your ideas, and you're not fighting for yourself. You're fighting for me. So if you're in a room and somebody's trying to drown you out, know that your voice is there to help make me um, be as productive as I can be. And something about saying that gave them permission. And then he said, and if you want to have another dinner with me, he said, I'm going to go back. I'm going to talk to the guys. We're going to work on this culture. But if you have a problem, let Valerie know, and we'll have another dinner. And so I started having dinner with the women in the White House, the senior women, on a regular basis. And what happened is the answer to your question. We developed a relationship with each other. And when you walk in a room and you've had dinner the night before with somebody, and you're about to go out on a limb and say something that might not be popular, and you catch the eye of someone who knows you and with whom you have this bond of trust, it's easier. And so part of what I always say is that there is safety in numbers. And we have to all take the time to develop relationships with people with whom we work outside of the conference table. And in doing so, it gives you that strength. And by the beginning of the second term, half of our department heads in the White House were run by women. That's unprecedented in any other White House. And uh, the s most senior position is assistant to the president. And by the time President Obama left office, every woman who had that position, with the exception of me, who had it from the beginning, had been promoted into that position. And I think that says a lot about the kind of culture he was determined to create. It doesn't happen on day one, but it does happen with hard work and effort. And I spent a lot of time mentoring the younger women, and a couple of them I recruited because they said, oh, I couldn't possibly work in the White House. I have young children. I said, oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can work in this White House. We're determined that you can work in this White House. But you have to make that clear to people. You have to prove to them that it isn't just a policy on the books, but it's a part of the culture. You have to lead by example, and that's what I tried to do. You know, this comes up a, a bit in your book as well, but it's, it wasn't just a, a situation about um, gender. It was also a situation about race. And you speak particularly in, um, in, during, the, during the election, um, the team is really focusing on Iowa. And there was a lot of pressure to get him to win Iowa, to sort of set him up to show that he could be a real com competitor for Hillary Clinton. That's right. And you have a line in there that, that is just very simple, and it just says, even with the group, that was there to help elect the first African-American president, it was still difficult to talk about race. Sure. And it's, it sounds a little bit like the, this in, the, in a similar way where there's work to be done, even with the best intentions, the best intention group, there's work to be done around gender. Um, how, what, do you have any advice for, in a time where it may feel like the stakes are even ha higher and harder, how do people go about having that conversation, be it gender or race, um, and how do you, continue, how do you keep advocating for it, uh, despite maybe not President Obama leading the White House? Good question. So I think you have to go into the conversation knowing it's going to be uncomfortable. And one of the things that I often do um, is say to people, this is going to be an uncomfortable conversation. So you kind of set the expectations. And then I think you have to do it from a, pers from a perspective of beginning with the personal. Because I think people can hear you better if you describe what your situation is like and, and, and why it's so important. And so that's why in my book I spent a lot of time talking about my early years where I didn't feel like I had the support system and how, um, how hard it was for me. And then when you find your voice and you are advocating not just for others but for yourself, it kind of shows the path. And so I think these conversations uh, need to be had in, self, in safe places. Uh, I'll give you an example. At the University of Chicago uh, Law School, where I'm on the faculty, they now have brown bag lunches for su students to come in and talk about um, touchy subjects from different perspectives and see if they can listen to one another. And I think modeling that behavior in environments where it's safe, this is not something you should do on Twitter or social media. <laughs> this is something you actually have to do in person, where you can look to the eyes of the person that you're talking to in the hopes that they can hear you uh, through your life experiences. And I think the more personal we describe it, best example I can think of from our administration is when President Obama said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon Martin. Everybody heard him in a way that they might not have if he hadn't personalized it. And it was a spontaneous comment that he made, but it was just profound. And I think the same thing when we talk about gender equity, all of the issues that are important to working families 
I talk about through my experience as a working mom. That's how I started in answering your question. And so I think creating these safe spaces where we can have hard conversations. And then the other thing that I've started doing lately, and I've gotten some pushback, particularly from younger women on this, and so I'll test it with this audience. When I talk about gender equity, which is a big piece of what we do, which is all we do through the uh, United State of Women, which we created, we had a White House Council on Women and Girls when we were in the White House. This administration didn't continue the council, and so Tina Chin and I, who started the council, have created this not-for-profit. So we're still doing gender equity on the ground where actually all the magic happens um, without the support from, from the White House. But when you look at all of these issues that affect working families, you could say we should focus on it because it's the right thing to do. And that's what I said in my 20s and 30s and 40s and beginning of my 50s. Now I say don't. Do it because there's a business imperative for diversity being a strength. And that's the case I make to the private and public sector, that our country will be more globally competitive when we appreciate we need all of the talent, not just coming to the table, but staying to the table. And far too many women are opting out of the job market, not because they want to, but because they have no choice. I've met women who said, look, I couldn't afford childcare. I wasn't making as much as the childcare was costing me. In two thirds of our states, childcare costs more than in-state tuition for a university. And so it's a barrier to entry, or I needed flexibility, or I wanted to be able to take a leave so that I could stay home with my child, and I wanted my husband to be able to do the same. If we don't start tackling all of those barriers, we're going to fall behind, because the rest of the world is focusing on those issues, and we're competing for talent. And so I also believe that if it's a nice to do, the first time the economy starts to shrink and people start looking at their initiatives, they'll cut it off unless they consider it a business imperative. So I'm now making this appeal to people from that perspective. And, but I did get some pushback from people who said, well, it is the right thing to do. Of course it's the right thing to do, but that's not necessarily what's gonna win the day and make it sustainable. Right. Now, I'm, let's go back in time. Uh, and you, when you made the switch to uh, work on um, Mayor Washington's campaign, or to enter into his administration, um, he had recently become the first African-American mayor of Chicago. Um, and later, you worked on the presidential campaign of the first African-American um, president. Uh, Harold Washington, unfortunately, did not, was not alive for most of, the, for most of the, his second term. Um, and I think that you took some lessons from how he had set up his government and applied them to how you thought about the administration um, under Obama. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned working with him and then yes. seeing the transition? Yes, very much so. And in fact, you know, I'm not sure if there would have been a President Obama if there hadn't been a Mayor Washington. I think his style and approach was one of inclusion one of appreciating the diversity of our city, recognizing that you want to govern a city as big and complex as Chicago. You need to be surrounded by people who represent the whole city. Even though he was the first black mayor, he considered himself the mayor of all of Chicago, and he made a concerted effort to reach out broadly. And I think if you look at um, how he did in his first race compared to how he did in the second race, his first race, he won, but he didn't have the majority of the city council, so he hadn't won um, a lot of the wards that were predominantly white. And in the second race, he had the majority of the city council and, and earned many of the votes of the entire city. And so I think it sends a message about you can't just presume that people are going to ignore your color. You have to work at it, and you have to earn it. I'm not saying it's fair. I already told you, if life isn't fair. But that's what you have to do. And I think President Obama had the same uh, progressive philosophy but rec and recognized he had to have a big tent. He had to make people feel comfortable with him, people to understand that no matter what walk of life they had, that he was looking out and advocating for them. And I think a lot of that came from the example that Mayor Washington set. When Mayor Washington was elected, having grown up most of my life in Chicago, nobody that I knew thought he could be elected. That was Chicago ready for its first black president, given its history and racial polarization? And I think, in a sense, our country felt the same way with President Obama. Both Harold Washington and Barack Obama, though, believed in their ability to be um, appealing to a broad cross-section of their constituencies. When you uh, talk about the, um, the election, I think that, that there, that's one of the most exciting parts of the book. There's just so much energy and uh, this building momentum that you have. Can you take us back to um, some of the moments from the campaign trail um, that, where you started to think, maybe actually this guy could win? What was, it, was there a moment that you sort of felt, actually, maybe, maybe he's, maybe he's got it? Yeah. yeah, maybe this isn't like just an insane thing to be doing. Yeah. 
my parents kept telling me, when are you going to come back to work? Like, your real job. I was CEO of a real estate company, and they were so worried that company was going to just like go down the tubes and that I would be crushed and disappointed. Um, I think when I began to really, really believe it, not just in my heart, but in my mind, because I always in my heart thought he should be president. The question was, would it work? And I think after the night of the Iowa caucuses, I tell the story in my book of going uh, with, with then Senator Obama and David Pluff, who was his campaign manager, and Reggie Love, his body guy, and we went to uh, the, a caucus site. And you're allowed to go to the site, you just can't go in the room. And when we drove into the parking lot, it was packed. And David Pluff said, who'd been to many a caucus before, was my first one, oh my gosh, there's something really special happening here. And uh, we get to the caucus site and it's like 99% white. And everybody was like giving him a fist bump and a high five when they walked in the door. And I thought, that's a good sign. Uh, they're not just shying away from him. And when we left that night, I thought, my goodness. And by the time we got back to our hotel, we were going to have dinner with a bunch of our friends. I don't think we'd gotten through our salad course when they said, results are coming in faster than we thought. And it looks like you've won. And I remember standing watching him speak that night. And I thought, well, not only do I think now, obviously, you can win the Iowa caucuses, but I think you can be president of the United States. And even after New Hampshire, which was an unexpected, brutal defeat, it's actually the best thing that could have happened to our campaign. And he used to often say, it should never be too easy. People need to see how hard I'm willing to work to earn it. And I don't know that it needed to be quite as hard as it was, <laughs> but I, I think there was something to a long uh, primary uh, season because it took him around the country really trying to earn you know, caucus and election after election. And that gave the American people a chance to really get to know him before he was in the general election. And so I think it was actually really good for us. Now, there's so much that we could talk about, I'm sure, during the eight years of the White House, but we unfortunately don't have enough time today to go into it. Um, but I want to take, take, fast forward to eight years. Um, and there's a moment in the book where after eight years of work <clears throat> and what I think is probably a very noisy White House, dogs running around, parties happening, people coming in and out. Um, All of the above. Yeah, the election happens and your administration has to dismantle itself. Yeah. And, um, and what happens in the White House, which, is, uh, which maybe does, not everyone knows, but people start to leave. And so it's sort of a slow drain, and you're left in what seems to be a very quiet building. Um, and, there, and it sounds to me like those were some very hard days, some very difficult days of, of shutting down an administration you obviously loved um, and facing an unknown future. Um, for yourself and for the, co the country. Um, when, you're, when you're sitting there and you're thinking about it, what were you feeling, what was one thing that you felt really proud of, and then what was one thing that you felt like you failed at? Yeah, so I'm not gonna lie to you, that election was soul crushing uh, for me and for many, of, many people around the country, obviously, and I didn't see it coming, and then I wondered about that, and I wondered about why only 43% of eligible voters voted, and uh, that, gave me great pause, like what's wrong that people don't appreciate their responsibility in a democracy. Uh, so it was a tough period. One thing that President Obama made clear to us was that he expected us to have an orderly transition. And I um, have been very public in disagreeing with President Bush about a lot of his policies. But one place where um, I have enormous respect to him is that he too said, I am determined to have an orderly transition. And that's what our government and our democracy um, requires at, at its foundation, is that yes, you can run a very heated campaign, you can have differences of opinion during a campaign, but when the election is over, it's in the collective interest of our country to hand the, bat the baton over smoothly. And so as we handed that baton over, I'm very proud of the fact that we, we did as best we could during that eight years. And when I think about, you know, the 20 million people who have health care, many for the first time, and how hard that was and how so many people said to President Obama, why are you prioritizing health care so early in your administration? You're so popular and it's going to get so much pushback and seven presidents before you tried to do it and they didn't. And he said, well, what's the point in having political capital if you don't use it for something that you think benefits our country? And so when I look back over all of our accomplishments over the eight years, which are um, too plentiful to recount to you right here, the fact that we did it without ever losing sight of why we were there, uh, I will tell you just a brief, brief story of the night that the Affordable Care Act passed. Uh, I was home in my pajamas with my popcorn getting ready to watch the vote because we pretty much knew we had it wrapped up. And I 
get a phone call from the president's assistant, and she says, uh, President Obama would like for you to come back to the White House to watch the vote. Um, he's inviting everybody who worked on it from the junior most person on your staff to the vice president. And I said, you know, I'm home, I got my popcorn, I'm good. <laughs> and uh, she said, uh, President Obama would like everybody who worked on the Affordable Care Act to <laughs> come back to the White House. And I was like, oh, that's right, I do work for him, okay. So back to the White House, we went, and then he invites everybody up to the Truman Balcony, and Mrs. Obama was out of town, which is how he got away with inviting 100 people upstairs on no notice. And it was an unseasonably warm night, and um, at about 2 a.m. after, I will confess, I'd had two martinis, I'm not gonna tell you what he'd had to drink, uh, I sidled up to him and I said, it's, and it was on March 21st, it was unseasonably warm, even for D.C., and it felt a lot like Chicago's election uh, in November of 2008. And I said to him, how do you feel tonight compared to how you felt on election night? And he said, there's no comparison. Election night was just about getting to this night. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he never put his political interests ahead of you, the American people, is what I'm most proud of. And to have been able to serve from January 20th of 2009 to January 20th of 2017 was just the height of my, of my life. It's <laughs> Uh, now, what's the one thing that you, fail, you failed at <laughs> after well, that inspiring yeah, story? Well, yeah, no, no, yeah. Oh, you wanted that question? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, there are, there are um, a few things that we really tried to get done, and we were unsuccessful. Comprehensive immigration reform is one. We worked on it from the beginning to the end, and as you know, he ultimately signed executive orders trying to give relief to young people particularly who came here through no fault of their own and were by citizens by every possible measure except for a piece of paper, and it was profoundly disappointing that politics got in the way of something that at that point had bipartisan support. And it was simply because um, of politics that we couldn't get it called for a vote. Uh, the other thing that just breaks my heart is that we weren't able to get legislation through, just the most sensible legislation to keep guns out of the wrong hands. Uh, 32 plus thousand people die every year from gun violence, two thirds who take their own lives not to mention the countless others who are wounded and the families who are uh, never whole again. And you know, again, we were unable to get Washington to, to take the kind of action that they should have taken. We've seen change at the state level, but because guns move around um, over state lines, it's really, you, that's one where you really do need a national solution. So that's two, um, comprehensive immigration reform is one that now there has been some progress of late, but one where, again, we had bipartisan support from you know, the most conservative to the most liberal and everyone in between, and politics got in the way. And I think my biggest frustration in Washington is that we could never break that fever of politics getting in the way of people who were elected by their constituents to do a job, and they were so afraid that if they did what they knew in their heart was the right thing to do, that there would be political consequences. And the only way that changes is when the American people decide to hold their elected officials accountable and make clear what they want them to do. And then when they don't do it, vote them out of office. I like that uh, this is a sign of her overachievement. I asked for one thing that you failed at and you gave me three. <laughs> In the spirit of full disclosure, because you think about those things. And you know, and that's part of yeah. that's part of it. It's a it's you know, you run as fast and as hard as you can, but I was old enough to know that eight years is really not that long. And you have to wake up. You know, people have said to me, Well, how did you get by on so little sleep? Fear. Fear of not making, you know, maximizing every moment we were there. Yeah. Last year, you were on stage at South by Southwest with my um, wonderful colleague, Kara Swisher, um, and you talked a little bit about a feeling of both optimism and terror. Yes. Those are the two words that you used. Yeah. Um, where are you now on the spectrum? Do you feel more optimistic or still terrified, or both? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I think I feel more optimism, and in part, it's because I've been traveling around the country, and I've, I, as I say, I call them just like ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things. And with another year of under my belt of seeing what's happening, the magic, as I said about it earlier, around the country, it gives me optimism. I think that the midterm elections made me feel better. And uh, even though I still am troubled by the people who didn't vote, there were far more people who did than had, than had voted in prior midterms. And I think 
that there has been an awakening that elections do have consequences and people beginning to feel empowered to do something about it. And there's, you know, starting with the day after the last inauguration, the Women's March and all of the response to the Muslim ban or the families being separated at the border and the positive enthusiasm around this new class of people who've been elected to Congress as well as at the state and local level. I saw Stacey Abrams backstage and you know, the terrific job that she did running a great campaign and the fact that she's still a national figure shows us that just because you lose an election you don't give up hope and you still get in that fight. And so seeing all of that activism and advocacy uh, and spirit makes me feel like the, that our better days are ahead, but I'm still worried. I'm, I'm worried that there is a, an erosion in so many levels and we have to fight it. And I think the lesson, of course, is, is that you never can be complacent. And something as simple as a woman's right to choose what to do with her own body, I, I mean, I remember Roe versus Wade, and we thought, okay, that's done. We're settled. It'll never come up again. And then here we see it's rearing its ugly head. And so I think the moral of the story is you gotta be vigilant and everybody has to feel empowered to use your voice to make sure that our country continues to move forward, not backwards. Yeah. Speaking of moving forward, we are facing um, a pretty big election coming up, and we already have seen a lot of primary action in, yes. in the Democratic Party. Yes, embarrassment of riches, I call it. Yes, yes. Uh, are you going to be throwing your hat in the ring? For president? No. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have enough people and more coming. So, no. You know what I really enjoy doing right now, Melissa? I love being able to give advice. Um, I'm an only child, and so when I, after our, um, I got married and my mother planned my wedding, I checked out completely, um, a sign, um, <laughs> now that I think about it. Uh, when she finished, she said, I only have one child, and now I have all this expertise. What am I gonna do? I don't wanna be a wedding planner, but I got all this expertise. And I kind of feel like the same thing I've had really is so much of my life has been a part of both service as well as politics. And so I'd like to help as many of the Democrats who are running as possible. I've met with several of them. I've given them my best uh, advice and I wanna see how they do. It is a gauntlet. And you know, how do you do when you take a punch that's fair? How do you do when you take a punch that's not fair? How do you do when you spend six months in Iowa? I loved Iowa. Not everybody's gonna love Iowa. Um, I'm just saying. It, I learned so much about our country during the time we spent there, but it isn't something where everybody thrives in that environment. And so it's a real, it's, the reason why I like it, I should be more specific, it is a very retail politics state where you have to go in people's living rooms and talk to five people at a time. It isn't always a room that's full, and you have to be at your best. Uh, one time, President Obama had to call somebody's daughter who was like 16, trying to get her father's support, and the daughter's like, no, I'm busy, I can't talk to you right now, click. <laughs> well, that happens all the time in Iowa. And so you have to earn it, and you have to, as President Obama used to say, you have to lift up your hood and let people you know, see what's in there and kick your tires. And so I'm looking forward to seeing the terrific candidates that we have right now, how they do running that gauntlet. I'm gonna take a few questions from the audience because I know that there's a lot of people who want, who'd like to. If you wanna add your question to the pile, it's slido.com and then you select Salon H and hashtag South by Southwest or SXSW. Um, so the first question is um, from Anonymous. I'm a diehard Democrat. I feel the party has disconnected from both the working class whites and the men and women who work in private sector. What do we do? Well, first of all, I don't think that's true. I think that that's a lot of what you see on the surface in the news, but when you really talk to the people who I see leading the party and who are interested in governing our country, I think you see a lot of people who appreciate the fact that business is the economic engine of our country and we need to create an environment where businesses can thrive and grow, that's where our employment base comes from, but also where businesses are not taking advantage of workers. Um, in terms of this sense of, uh, whether or not the party has abandoned the white working class, I don't think that's true at all. If you look at all of the basic fundamental uh, pillars of the Democratic Party, we're trying to grow the middle class. We're trying to grow ladders of opportunity for people to move into the middle class. We're trying to make college more affordable. We're trying to improve our public schools. We're trying to make sure that people are treated fairly with their retirement so that when they retire, they can retire with dignity. We're trying to make sure that everybody has access to affordable health care. That's one of the major reasons people go into bankruptcy is if they can't afford health insurance. So I think when you get behind the superficial rhetoric and you really look at the pillars of the Democratic Party, I think they're ones that should resonate broadly across our country. Uh, this is a straightforward one, also from Anonymous. How can we talk Michelle into running for president? We can't. 
<laughs> we can't, I assure you, not at all. That doesn't mean that she's not committed to service. And I think she will, I know she will spend the rest of her life committed to service, but she's never really had an appetite for politics. She's always had an appetite for, for service. How are the Obamas doing? Right they're great. Good. Just saw them over the weekend. They're in good spirits. Good. And uh, I think they're both very thrilled about using this platform that they have of popularity and making it a force for good through his foundation and their collective efforts. And so uh, troubled, of course, by what they're seeing happening in Washington, but optimistic, just as I am, about what they see happening across the country and around the world. I think the Michelle question goes to um, sort of a, a sense that um, the Democratic Party right now is pretty fractured a lot amongst a number of candidates. And I think there are people in the party that are, are sort of asking, why can't the Obamas come back and help create a leadership within this vacuum? Do you see that as um, uh, an opportunity for them or something that the, a problem for the Democratic Party, that that's sort of the take from folks? I think it's an opportunity for the Democratic Party. So, uh, Melissa, what you might say is fractured. I say we have a big tent. And I think that that's part of the strength of the party is, is that we do cast our net very broadly and all are welcome. And I think it's okay to have a healthy debate of ideas. One of the pieces of advice though that I have given to um, a number of the candidates who are running is do keep your eye on the prize, which is winning the general election. And be careful how you treat your uh, competitors in the primary. And, and I'm much more interested, for example, in hearing somebody proactively say what they stand for and how they would lead our country than tearing down their opponents. That's just not what I find resonates with me. Uh, anybody can tear down the opponent. Leadership is what are you going to do? And so I've encouraged people to focus on that and to focus on why what's happening now in Washington doesn't reflect the values of, I don't think, the country and certainly not the Democratic Party. For voters, is there, are there particular things that we should be looking out for, um, in, either in terms of leadership skills or policies that we need to particularly pay attention to? What's your advice for sure. voters? Sure. Take the time to get to know who's running. Uh, don't just fall in love, but really get to know the person. And that means date them for a little while and see how they do and, and try to look at their track record as an indication of how they would lead going forward. There is no job quite like the President of the United States, and so it's hard to say that you're prepared for it. I don't think anybody is when they step into office. And, uh, but yet, there are leadership qualities that I think are important in how one governs. This is different than running a business. I mean, there are a whole different skill set that remembering that you have co-equal branches of government and that you cannot just simply say, this is the way it's going to be. You've got to be able to figure out how to bring people together. And you also have to figure out a way of making sure that you are constantly uh, in touch with the American people. And a big piece of what I did in the White House was designed to get that feedback into the president so he made informed decisions based on what you all say. And we often had constituents that had completely opposite viewpoints. And you have to figure out Compromise is not a dirty word. Um, don't compromise your ethics and your uh, integrity and your character. And I'm really proud of the fact that we didn't have a single scandal in eight years. That's important to us. <laughs> Just saying. But in, in, addition, in addition to that, you do have to really stay in touch. It means you've got to get outside of that bubble and really listen. And so. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that when we're paying attention, we're pretty discerning. I mean, you know BS when you see it. Trust your instincts. If you think somebody is just talking a good game, but they don't have the ability to truly move people together uh, and move the country forward, then that's not the person for you. And I do think we have lots of really good candidates who are in the mix right now. And that's a good thing, I think. I'm not one of those people who's like, we should narrow it down and not have so many candidates. I think the real leaders will bubble up to the top. Were there any scandals in particular that you had in mind when you're thinking? <laughs> Again, didn't I tell you we shouldn't talk about anybody else? We should just say what we did. What we did was run a very well within the lines administration. <laughs> um, this is a question from Shonda. Uh, black women are, fast, are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. What can we do to further policy for equal pay, fair pay, et cetera? Well, first of all, that is absolutely true. And I think 
One of the challenges for entrepreneurs is access to capital, and I'm heartened to see that there are so many new um, opportunities available for women of color to access that important capital. And we should be doing what we can, as I said earlier, to support that basket of working family issues, which is everything from equal pay, paid leave, paid sick days, et cetera. And for entrepreneurs, they need that access to capital and they need the business. And we have to recognize that, it, look, if you're an African-American woman who started your own business and you're beginning to get a little traction, it's against a lot of odds that are going against you. And so you're a pretty safe bet. This is, a, this is more of a personal one um, from Anonymous. I'm a new mom privileged to have a great support system and work environment, but I'm struggling to maintain my previous level of productivity, probably because you have a baby. And you have, you're not getting any sleep. That's why yeah. you can't be productive. <laughs> Look, um, oh my gosh, I have so much to say. You have to really buy my book. Um, <laughs> so one of the stories I tell in the book was, first of all, so picture it's 2 a.m. in 1985, and I'm sitting in a conference room, uh, trying to close a real estate deal. And I get up and I say, well, I'm just gonna go to the Xerox machine. And then I say, oh, I'm gonna get up and go check voicemail because we didn't have cell phones back then. Or I'm gonna go to the vending machine. Where am I going? To the bathroom, because that's what you do when you're eight and a half months pregnant. And that's what I was at the time. And I kept trying to pretend there was nothing happening down here. And I thought I had to do everything myself. And so another 2 a.m. story is when after my daughter was born, I'd gone back after maternity leave, and I'm up making baby food from scratch. Why? Why am I making baby food from scratch? She would have been perfectly healthy with some food out of a jar, but I put so much on myself that I should have relieved some of those burdens, and I should have like made my husband do some more, which he tried to do, but he was so poor at it, and I just said, let me do it. <laughs> but everybody's poor at it. I should have given the poor guy a chance to fail. I just took it away from him before he um, really showed me that he would have failed anyway. But <laughs> I digress. Um, I've got to stop beating up on him. Uh, but the biggest point I want to make to the young working moms is, or the older working moms too, is, is that it's just hard. And I kept thinking, well, if I were smarter, if I were more efficient, better organized, if I slept fewer hours, maybe it wouldn't be so hard. And I am ashamed of the fact that I kept how hard it was um, from myself. I didn't honestly say to myself, this is hard because I thought I was superwoman, and I certainly didn't share it with my friends or my family. And I think that that's a disservice. Because if we think and we pretend like it's easy, then how are we gonna get any help? And we also will think that we're all alone and we're the only ones struggling, where everybody around you is struggling. They're just putting on their best face. And I do think one of the strengths of the millennial generation is that you have no filter. You just, you say everything. And I think that's a good thing. And then when you say it's hard and then you tell people what you need to thrive, the chances of you getting it go up dramatically. And, it, and I didn't do that, and I wish that I had. So the other point I would make is they do grow up. They will get older, and then they're not so hard anymore. And then they're actually a net positive. But that happens around age six, and then they go dark again, like 12, 13, 14, <laughs> particularly the girls, it's really bad. And then they go off to college, and just as they leave for college, you fall in love with them all over again. And that's just part of the torture of being a parent. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I can't, I think it's Glenda. Do you see the Green New Deal as something that Democrats should more widely embrace in their platforms during the upcoming election? I think it's gotten a lot of traction. And I think the fact of the matter is that we need big ideas. And we need to not just, I mean, we need to be disruptive to the status quo. If we go on our current trajectory, our environment is gonna be in jeopardy. Uh, our entire kind of fabric of our society is at risk. And so I love the fact that we have some bold new ideas in our nation's history. There were, I mean, Social Security was considered impossible. Medicare and Medicaid were considered impossible. The Affordable Care Act was considered impossible. And so I think what we, going to the moon was considered impossible. So I think having some very big ideas that are bold and demonstrate that we're taking a long view beyond just our current budget, but really looking to the future, should be debated within not just our party, but within the country. And we shouldn't just say no because it's big and bold. We should really look at it and figure out Maybe it's a moonshot, and maybe we get from here to there incrementally, but we should all be willing to go for moonshots. Uh, from Andrew, 
Um, I should have, I really should have worn my glasses on this stage. I know. <laughs> Take us back to the moment um, VP, Vice President Biden announced his support for same-sex marriage before the president. What was that discussion like and how did you influence the response? Well, the good news is by the time Vice President Biden announced his support, he already knew where President Obama was and I don't think he would have ever gotten out of ahead of President Obama had he not known exactly where he stood on the issue. And as President Obama has said very openly, he evolved over time and I think he did, many of you may have seen his interview with Robin Roberts where he talked about the fact that he was in favor of same-sex marriage. And he said he'd started out thinking that legal unions were legally, you know, maybe it's from his legal background, he thought, well, that's just as good. And it was meeting same-sex couples on the rope line at a fundraiser, one in particular, I remember where the guy was saying, oh God, I couldn't braid my daughter's hair. And President Obama was like, yeah, when Michelle would leave town, I couldn't braid my, Malia's hair either. And he was like, yeah, there's kind of a back to the humanity of the individual stories. And then when his daughters would come home and they had uh, friends whose parents were same sex uh, couples and they would say, well, why, are, why, why don't they get to have what everyone else has? And I will say to you, one of the most extraordinary days the whole time I was in the White House was the day that the marriage equality decision came down. And uh, it was also the same day we went to Charleston for Reverend Pickney's funeral, he and the eight people who were murdered in, uh, in Charleston. And so it was a day of, you know, kind of up and down. And to come back and see the White House with the rainbow across uh, as the sun went down was just an extraordinary moment. So no, like, behind the scenes conversations other than I, I probably would say we wish that the president had a chance to get out first, but um, they were completely in sync on it. Uh, we're running out of time now, so I wanna just ask two final questions. Um, how do you like your martini? I like my martini very dry. You don't actually have to put any vermouth in it. It just sounds better when you say martini, but it's really just vodka straight up. Um, <laughs> with olives. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for this crowd, who is mostly media, tech, entrepreneurs, uh, politically active folks, what's your advice for them? What should they take away as they face the next couple of years? Technology is an incredible tool. It has changed the way the world works. It has brought us all closer together. But there is no substitute for human interaction. And so once in a while, look up from your device and talk to the person sitting next to you and be present in their lives in the hopes that they be present in yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you.